Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! So, where shall we start? <laughs> you choose. Why don't we start with Donald Trump? President-elect of the United States uh, hasn't given a press conference for six months. And if we'd been starting to forget just how different his style of politics is to the Washington consensus, then we were reminded that he doesn't do things by half. And a freewheeling and at times chaotic hour of uh, taking and answering questions, he had plenty to say about what he intends to do with his business interests once he gets into the Oval Office, about his tax returns, he won't publish them, job creation and the wall with Mexico, which is still going ahead. But the most explosive part was his response to allegations so far entirely unsubstantiated, but published in some media outlets that his election team colluded with Russia and that Russia held compromising material about his private life. Let's have a look. I saw the information, I read the information outside of that meeting. Uh, it's all fake news, it's phony stuff, it didn't happen, and it was gotten by opponents of ours. President-elect, Mr. President-elect, since you are attacking no, our news not organization, you. Not can you. you give us a chance? Your organization You are attacking terrible. our news organization. organization. Can you give us a chance Let's to go. ask a question, sir? Go ahead. I think it's a disgrace, and I say that, and I say that, and that's something that Nazi Germany would have done and did do. I think it's a disgrace. That information that was false and fake and never happened got released to the public. As far as BuzzFeed, which is a failing pile of garbage, writing it, I think they're going to suffer the consequences. They already are. Does anyone really believe that story? I'm also very much of a germaphobe, by the way. <laughs> believe me. There we go. He doesn't like Germans either. Anyway, we're joined now by the Foreign Affairs Analyst, Tim Marsh, a good friend of this program, and by Ted Malloch, the man who's expected to be Donald Trump's ambassador to the EU. Some said to Britain, but it looks like the EU has won. Is that true? I was in New York last week discussing it, but uh, can't be confirmed until it comes from his mouth. Okay, very well. Uh, Tim Marshall, let me start with you. Let's look at the provenance of this stuff. Mm -hmm. The particular stuff that BuzzFeed has, uh, has been publishing. A company in Washington called Fusion GPS, started by a journalist from the Wall Street Journal, is hired by a billionaire Republican to gather dirt on Donald Trump to stop him becoming the Republican candidate. That fails. Yes. A bunch of rich Democrats then pick up the contract from Fusion GPS because they want to stop him becoming president of the United States. The information is provided largely or compiled largely by a former British intelligence officer called Steele. This is paid for information that we cannot verify. Was it right to publish it? Probably not. Uh, and people that are desperate to believe it uh, and want to believe it, especially the most lurid allegations, which is what has garnered all the attention, um, are desperate to believe it, and so I think their suspension of disbelief is uh, suspended. Let me tell you a very quick story. Young reporter, 30, first time in Moscow, knock on the door, one o'clock in the morning, it was a young Natasha, and I knew exactly what was going on. So I closed the door with her on the outside of it. Because the way they work is that they try to get you on camera when you're young, and if you become a senior reporter, they've got something on you. Now, I knew that at 30 years old. Do I really believe that Donald Trump would be in a Moscow hotel suite acting in that manner in his 60s when he knows about how the world works? No, I don't. So if that doesn't add up, a lot of the other things don't add up. So bringing you to the question, Andrew, about being published, it was doing the rounds. Um, what gave it some credibility was when it was distilled down into two pages and, and the, uh, the authorities thought, that well, we need to show it to the president and the president-elect, and that opened the floodgates. I can understand it being published, but I just ask people that, that view things through their utter, utter dislike of Mr. Trump, mm -hmm. which, forgive me, some of which I share, future ambassador to the EU, some of which I share. <laughs> Yet to be confirmed. Yet to be, Yet to be confirmed. Or the UK. Um, <laughs> 
I do, you know, I mean, I'm not a Trump fan, but I just ask people to look at this story, not through the prism of their dislike mm -hmm. of this man, but through the prism of its reliability. And if it was exactly the same thing about Mr. Obama, wouldn't you be thinking, this looks dodgy? <laughs> well, that's what Mr. Trump did with Mr. Obama when he tried to make out he wasn't born in, in the United oh, no. States. So, I, I mean, another, but let, let me he did a whole to... bunch of things like that, and he's but, playing by the sword and he's dying by it, but, but that doesn't okay. make the allegations right. against him No, right. no, I understand. Yeah. No, though, let me come to the presumptive ambassador of somewhere. I mean, it could be Moldova, you never know. Uh -huh. uh, if you're lucky. Uh, is this damaging? Yeah, that's a story. <laughs> is this damaging Donald Trump? I think quite the opposite, actually. Do you? Why He's is used that? it to his advantage. I mean, yesterday, uh, it was an incredible news conference, uh, you know, press conference, and he comes out the winner. He looks confident, he looks robust, he defends himself, and he actually proves that the the news media, at least some part of it, is trying to delegitimize his presidency, his election, and it's doing it by the use of fake news. If it's not fake news, no. and, and we don't know, and we don't know. Let I, me tell you what the British intelligence told me this morning. Okay. This person, who they know, who was an MI6. This is Mr. Steele. It is Christopher Steele was also an FBI asset at one point in time, so he has intelligence uh, background, but he was paid by the people that you mentioned who were working for Jeb Bush in order to discredit him. The Democrats took over the contract, as you said. He kept adding to the dossier and using information given to him by the FSB in Russia, most of it fabricated. The more he put into the dossier, the more he got paid. So he made a sensationalist dossier, <coughs> as fat as possible, just like your lawyer charges you more billable hours in order to get paid more. You said most of it fabricated. Mm. What bit wasn't fabricated? I don't know what's fabricated and what's not. Oh. Obviously, so you don't know if most of it's fabricated. Well, I mean, the 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 stuff that we've read, the salacious stuff that we've read. But is some of it might be true. Well, the, it is true that Mr. Trump was in Moscow. For well, the Miss date. Universe context. Well, you know, these kinds of things are true as well. Right. I'm suggesting. Okay. You know. Why? It's interesting of what British intelligence uh, ha has been uh, saying here. Why was Mr. Steele so keen to get this out? Because he went to inordinate lengths. As I understand it, he even sent it to Senator McCain, mm. no friend of uh, Donald Trump. He was touting it around. And then suddenly he says, Gosh, I have to disappear. I'm now the Kremlin could now be after me. I mean, if he if if, if he's a former MI6 agent, he would he would have worked that out. Well, Steele knew Litvinenko apparently. We know what happened to Litvinenko, and that was the man killed, kept, in, was, yeah. murdered in London Polonia, with the yeah, Polonia. Yeah, the um, and you know, it is an odd state. Yes, he he took it to the FBI, the, the former FBI man who took it to McCain. Now you can justify this in that if he genuinely feels, look, this is the stuff that's swirling around about the future leader of the free world. Mm -hmm. It is necessary that the administration knows this mm -hmm. stuff is swirling around and knows that this is what right. people are saying. I think it, I think it is legitimate to have passed that on. It's legitimate for James Clapper well, to, well, to let, pass it on to let the Let me the ask two... you about that, Tim, because was it legitimate to be done in the way it was done? No. Well, the intelligence services in America had a report for the president, which they were also going to share with Mr. Trump, and I yes. believe parts of the Congress too, which was their best intelligence on Russia's involvement in the U.S. election. Yes. And that, they believe, was <coughs> authenticated. It was their work. They stood by it. It was a proper intelligence briefing for the Oval Office. To that, they attached a two-page uh, summary of Mr. Steele's 35-page report, which they don't know is whether it's just gossip, tittle-tattle, mm -hmm. or anything. Did that not, as the Washington Post, no friend of Mr. Trump this no. morning, as the Washington Post says, that devalues the intelligence that the president is getting. And the New York Times uh, has a similar uh, approach to this. I, I'm saying you can make the case that, you, that if this stuff is swirling around, they need to be aware of it. And of when, course. You're, when you're at the very, very top, you only know as much as the people below you tell you. You often don't know about this stuff. But there were two things yesterday that were really overlooked. One was Trump completely shifted and said, I think it was the Russians that hacked originally. That's mm -hmm. a shift. And the other one is the Rex Tillerson, uh, incoming Secretary of State, mm -hmm. uh, evidence to the House, where his attitude... Senate, to, to, excuse me, thank you, to the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, 
was so far away from all the things that Donald Trump has said about Russia that we've got either got a complete disconnect between the Secretary of State right. and the incoming president, or we actually saw the real U.S. policy towards Russia, which, which well, was I much more to, robust. And particularly against China, but I want to come yes. back to that in a minute. Michael, how this, this, this sort of thing must have happened to you every day when you were on Secretary <laughs> and leader of the Her Majesty's opposition? My memory must be playing me false. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't quite bring it to mind. Uh, I, I'm sure you remind me. Of the We've got the happens. dossier here. I'm sure you have. What do you make of it all? Look, um, I very much agree with what Tim's been saying. It, it may be highly entertaining stuff in a way. It's not much to do with us. This man... As, is, as the United Kingdom. As in the United Kingdom. This man, in eight days' time, is going to be president of the most powerful country in the world. He's going to be president of our most important ally. We've got to do what we can to build good relations with the new administration, to try and influence them where we can. That's what we in this country should be focusing on. But there is a serious undertone to some of this, and that is that we know now from the BBC's Paul Wood, who's been very well informed in all this, that on October the 15th, the US uh, Secret Intelligence Court, the FISA uh, Court, it issued a warrant to investigate two Russian banks. It had to do this because the CIA had discovered this, but of course the CIA is not allowed theoretically to operate in the United States itself. So it joined with the FBI and other agencies to investigate if Russian money went into the Trump campaign. This is an ongoing investigation, a warrant issued by the U.S. FISA court. If that was true, it would be illegal and a major problem for Mr. Trump. Well, it sounds so. I, I don't know that it's been corroborated or proven yet. I mean... Trump no, it's being investigated, is what been, I'm saying. And there are constant investigations about foreign entities dabbling in American... Because they're not allowed to finance U.S. elections. That's correct. It doesn't matter which government. Uh, and, you know, this has happened in, in previous elections where we've discovered after the fact that some governments have had to, ha you know, tried to have influence. So that, that would be very untowards and quite illegal. So it would be dangerous for Mr. Trump if that turned out well, to be no, true? No, certainly. I mean, again, these hypotheticals, you know, it would be dangerous no, if the well, Chinese not, did it or the North no, Koreans it, did it, it or anyone did it's it. It's not a hypothetical in the sense, it, it, we don't know if it happened, right. but it's not hypothetical in the sense that there is a there are six U.S. agencies no. involved in this investigation and a U.S. court has issued a warrant. There is some thought, just trying to step back from the lurid detail, that what is going on here is that all our emphasis is on Russia and Mr. Trump's relationship or attitudes to tr Russia, whereas the real story is his hardline attitude to China. And that came out in the Tillerson hearings yesterday. And, and that is actually probably more important. Look, if all these allegations are true, then uh, they are devastating, they are important. It's just that I don't see any reason to believe them, so it's fascinating tittle-tattle and everyone can have a good joke about it. But the substantive stuff is exactly what you say. Policy on Russia, which Mr Tillerson laid out yesterday, and policy on China. We may well be heading for, a, and I say we, a major trade war with China. Yes. Protectionism yes. led by the Trump administration. Now, they will both lose. The Chinese will lose more but the Americans will lose as well, and then we will lose if they have a trade war. And that's, that's the tough stuff. And the Chinese, um, we're also worried about the Russian battalions on the Estonian border. We should also be worried about what the Americans and Chinese are doing. Yesterday, the Chinese aircraft carrier sailed very close to Taiwan. Yes. It, not within its waters, but within its air identification zone. Now, that was a deliberate pushback to the Americans. The Taiwanese scrambled their jets mm -hmm. and their ships and went out to see them. Again, they're sending signals, but it's that sort of signal, and I think even more importantly, more likely, the trade war. That's the stuff that's going to actually impact our lives. President Obama told us at the start of the referendum campaign that the way forward for trade deals were multilateral, regional bloc trade deals, and that if Britain left the EU, we'd be at the back of the queue for a bilateral deal. Could I suggest to you that he was wrong on both accounts, that the future now is back to bilateral deals, the Trans-Pacific deal is over, TTIP, the North Atlantic deal, is all but over, the French elections will probably kill it dead, um, and that bilateral deals are back in vogue. Oh, and there's one more thing you can add. Since are we at said, the front of the queue? I've said all this in print. Indeed. Have you? The UK is now at the front of the queue. Oh, yeah. all right. Heard it here first. Good news? It, it is good news uh, if it happens. And I hope it will. But Tim is right. 
if the if the Trump administration plunges the world into the kind of mm. protectionism we saw in the 1930s, indeed, which was a Republican administration it, it, that did that, it, 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 this would be disastrous for the whole world economy and disastrous for us as well as for the United States and China. Okay. Would you We're, like to work with Nigel Farage, by the way? Would I like to work with him? I'm not a UK citizen. I don't belong to a political party here. Well, he's have... not an American citizen, but yeah. he thinks he can get a job there. <laughs> that, that you were meeting seem, him today, that, you know? That doesn't seem likely. Either. Were you meeting him today? I have had conversations with him on numerous occasions, right. actually, yes. But well, uh, Wherever you're ambassador of, will you come back and speak to us? I'll be glad to. I watch your show. Oh. <laughs> along with the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> Will you also pass on, because the Labour leader here, Jeremy Corbyn, has repeated his offer to Donald Trump to visit a London mosque with him uh, oh. if and when he comes over? Well, I think that'll be a very high priority. Thank <laughs> you both. <laughs> Thank you. A former MI6 officer has gone into hiding after being named as the source of the latest allegations against President-elect Donald Trump. Christopher Seale produced a dossier last year which included the allegations that Mr Trump had been caught in compromising financial and personal activities. The allegations are unproven and America's CIA, which has acknowledged the existence of the dossier, says it has made no judgment about its credibility. Here's our security correspondent Gordon Carrera on the British connection. The murky world of intelligence gathering in Moscow. A secret dossier of allegations about Donald Trump and Russia, all written by a former member of MI6, the British Secret Service. This is Christopher Steele, the author, a man used to keeping a low profile, but who's now at the centre of international controversy. His house was unoccupied today. He's supposed to have told neighbours to look after his cats, and he's said to be lying low, fearing for his safety. So what do we know about Christopher Steele? He's 52 years old. In the 1990s, he worked undercover for MI6 in Moscow and became one of their Russia experts. After leaving, he founded Orbis, a private intelligence company, with a former colleague. Last year, he was commissioned by Donald Trump's opponents to look into the tycoon's Russian connections. He ended up with 35 pages of allegations about Trump's personal, financial and political life. Orbis are headquartered here. There's no sign of Chris Steele, though. He is a man with contacts in Moscow. But so far, there's been no confirmation that the extraordinary allegations he dug up there are definitely true. Thanks to his past as a spy, Steele is unlikely to have been able to travel to Moscow himself, so instead will have relied on intermediaries to gather information. Moscow is a difficult place uh, to work in. The Russians have a habit, because of their history, of secrecy and deception. The other complicating factor is money. Uh, people, uh, if you're going to give someone money to tell you something, there is uh, a strong possibility that they will tell you what you want to hear. Alexander Litvinenko, a former Russian agent who fled to London, investigated powerful figures in Moscow and was killed by radioactive poison, it's alleged on the orders of the Kremlin. His widow told me such investigations carry risks. I believe it's very dangerous, particularly after the death of my husband. Because when you just approach very specific information, particularly when this information is very close to very powerful people, you might be in this line and you just easily might be killed. The Russian dossier was not written for public consumption, but American spies have briefed its outlines to the man it's all about, their incoming president. Its author also never expected to be in the spotlight. But in the feverish atmosphere of American politics today, secrets are no longer as safe as they were. Gordon Carrera, BBC News. So, as we've heard, this controversy raises serious questions about the extent to which Russia has tried to undermine the political process in America and whether Donald Trump is too close to the country's leaders. Well, today, some of the president-elect nominees for the top jobs in the new administration have made it clear that they continue to regard Russia with a degree of suspicion. Here's Nick Bryant from Washington. A week before inauguration day, it's usually an air of expectancy that you'll find on Capitol Hill, where the stage is being set for Donald Trump to take the oath of office. But the mood now is much more feverish, much more electric, as allegations swirl that Russia has compromising information about the president-elect that could make him susceptible to blackmail. You solemnly swear to give the committee the truth. Today, Donald Trump's choice as the new CIA director was on Capitol Hill. 
claiming the new allegations are unsubstantiated, but agreeing the Kremlin tried to interfere with the election. It's pretty clear about what took place here, about Russian involvement in efforts to hack uh, information and to have an impact on American democracy. I, I'm very clear-eyed about what that intelligence report says. Uh, and have every expectation as we continue to develop the facts, I will relay those not only to the president, but the team around him uh, and to you all, uh, so that we all can have a robust discussion about how to take on what is an enormous threat from cyber. As for the latest allegations contained in the unverified dossier, I promise I will pursue the facts wherever they take us. And the incoming Defense Secretary, James Mad Dog Mattis, also took aim at Vladimir Putin, taking a much tougher line than his new boss. I'm all for engagement, but we also have to recognize reality and what Russia is up to, and there's a decreasing number of areas where we can engage cooperatively and an increasing number of areas where we're going to have to confront Russia. At his news conference in Trump Tower yesterday, the president-elect rejected the unverified allegations that Russia has dirt on him in strong and colorful language. You are fake news. Go ahead. And after speaking last night to America's Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, he was just as vehement on Twitter. James Clapper called me yesterday to denounce the false and fictitious report that was illegally circulated. Made up. Phony facts. Too bad. But intelligence chiefs have made no judgment on the claims. The intelligence community has not made any judgment that the information in this document is reliable. And we didn't rely upon it in any way for our conclusion, said James Clapper in a statement. I emphasize this document is not a U.S. intelligence community product and that I do not believe the leaks have come from within the intelligence community. Team Trump is defiant, repeatedly insisting the allegations aren't true. What struck me most in Mr. Clapper's public statement that I'm sure your viewers can, can access for themselves is Mr. Clapper re-emphasizing that the intelligence community gave no credibility and veracity to, to those, uh, the fake and news documents. Yeah. Washington is a city used to intrigue and alleged scandal, but not on the eve of an inauguration. And despite what Trump's spokeswoman Kellyanne Conway said there, the intelligence community has not made a determination about the veracity or credibility of these claims. So we're seeing a continuation of that public rift between the Trump team and the intelligence community, and also equally extraordinarily, this public rift this morning on Capitol Hill between incoming senior members of his administration and the president-elect. You heard there his incoming defense chief publicly contradicting the incoming commander-in-chief over the threat posed by Vladimir Putin. Nick, thank you very much. More details have emerged about the former British spy at the centre of the allegations against President-elect Donald Trump. XMI6 agent Christopher Steele is in hiding after he was named as the man behind the dossier which makes lurid claims about Mr Trump. But today his business partner refused to tell ITV News whether their company was indeed involved. Our security editor Rohit Katru looks at the British connection. A debate at Cambridge University two years ago. In the audience is Christopher Steele. Now 52 years old, the father and former MI6 agent who worked in Moscow in the 90s and who as a private consultant wrote the Donald Trump dossier last year. He was not at his home tonight. There are claims he left because he's worried for his safety. No sign, too, at the security consultancy he runs with his business partner, who spoke to ITV News today. Can you just tell us a, a little bit about where he is, his can, can, you know, concerns for his safety? I think, I think in the light of everything that's happened over the last 24 hours, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to make any comments at the moment on, uh, on what's happened, whether Orbis has been involved or not. Um, and uh, we'll review that situation over the next couple of days. Russia. Orbis is his company which ITV News has learned was contracted by the FA to research rival bids for the 2018 World Cup, including Russia's. But this is the document that Steele wrote about Donald Trump, alleging the Kremlin interfered with the presidential campaign and that spies had tape of him which could be used for blackmail. He has a good reputation and I don't so know any, any reason to suppose that he wouldn't have written in a professional manner. Uh, he is, of course, outside 
the resources of you know, a big system which has the capability to have you know, greater capa much greater capability to, to assess. Today, the Russian embassy in London hit back, tweeting, MI6 officers are never X, briefing both ways against Russia and the US president. Perhaps it's not just secrets that are less safe than they were, so are the spies. Christopher Steele's private work was never meant to be made public. He's now exposed to global scrutiny and perhaps to insecurity too. Rohit Katru, ITV News. Well, today Donald Trump said that the head of US national intelligence had called him to denounce the what he called false and fictitious report. But it's still not clear exactly who circulated the dossier and why. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore reports on the continuing fallout. The president-elect has dismissed that dossier compiled by the former MI6 officer. Yesterday Trump describing it as simply fake and he was withering about the role that American intelligence agencies may have played in leaking it. Again, I think it's a disgrace that information would be let out. I swear to give but today, the nominee to be the next head of the CIA told senators he would be prepared to probe any evidence that linked Trump and his team to the Kremlin. There are unsubstantiated media reports that there were contacts between the Trump campaign and the Russians. Uh, if uh, confirmed, will you commit to exploring those questions? I promise I will pursue the facts wherever they take us. Uh, the Central Intelligence Agency has that as one of its singular functions, and you have my commitment that I'll do that. America's top spies are now distancing themselves from the claims that Trump and his team have a secret relationship with Moscow. But the outgoing head of national intelligence says he also couldn't ignore the reports. He wrote... The IC, that's the intelligence community, has not made any judgment that the information in this document is reliable, and we did not rely upon it in any way for our conclusions. However, part of our obligation is to ensure that policymakers are provided with the fullest possible picture of any matters that might affect national security. In Moscow, the Kremlin gave its first response to the allegations, saying, perhaps not surprisingly, they did not have compromising material on Donald Trump or any covert surveillance from when he stayed in the presidential suite at this luxury hotel three years ago. But looking ahead, Putin's spokesman said Trump was a leader they could do business with. We respect his readiness to talk. We respect his readiness uh, to try to understand what is fake and what is not. We respect um, his readiness to, to, to try to solve, to approach problems through dialogue, not through a bold confrontation. The relationship between Trump and Putin will soon become one of the most closely scrutinized aspects of the new administration. Well, a week tomorrow, Donald Trump will be, of course, president of the United States. And at that point, America's 17 separate intelligence agencies will report directly to him. And many may expect to be purged amid these ongoing recriminations. OK, Robert Moore in Washington, thank you. There is still no sign tonight of the former British spy at the centre of the lurid allegations against the US president-elect Donald Trump. Former MI6 agent Christopher Steele, who's believed to have compiled the dossier, is said to be in hiding tonight. As for Donald Trump, he's continued railing against media organisations which have reported the salacious details, but has tweeted about an attempt by US intelligence bosses to make amends by insisting their agencies did not leak it to the press. Here's our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman. Last night, America's most senior intelligence official tried dampening down Washington's biggest spying crisis since the Iraq war. I think it's a disgrace. And that's something that Nazi Germany would have done and did do. In New York, Donald Trump had accused his soon-to-be very own spying agencies of leaking against him. But later, Trump Tower took a call from James Clapper, Director of National Intelligence, who told the president-elect he didn't believe the agencies had leaked and that they had made no judgment on whether the now infamous dossier was reliable. Trump's tweet this morning was almost conciliatory by Trump's standards. James Clapper called me yesterday to denounce the false and fictitious report that was illegally circulated. Made up, phony facts, too bad.
The former MI6 officer who apparently wrote that report had fled from his home in Surrey today. Chris Steele, who is 52, has gone into hiding. And there was no reply from his office in London, Orbis Business Intelligence. Steele had co-founded the private investigation firm after leaving MI6 more than 10 years ago. Though from Steele's business partner, another former government official, there was this curious non-denial. Do you stand by what was I'm published? not going to make any comments at all about uh, the dossier that, uh, that is being spoken about in the press at the moment. OK. And can, can you confirm whether uh, Christopher Steele was involved at all? Is his name I is can't obviously. possibly comment on that at this moment in time. The 35-page dossier is in fact a series of 18 intelligence reports written between last June and December. They were commissioned by Fusion GPS, an American research firm. At first, they were funded by a wealthy Republican opposed to Trump, and then by Democrats. And they make the unverified claim that Moscow had been cultivating, supporting and assisting Donald Trump for at least five years. Though, from the Russian Foreign Ministry today, another denial. This is so far removed from reality. This would be the same as saying that the British Queen was recruiting someone in a Moscow food store. The most salacious and unverified claims are that the Russian Secret Service, or FSB, secretly filmed Mr. Trump with prostitutes in this Moscow hotel room three years ago. Compromat or compromise being an age-old form of FSB blackmail. Does anyone really believe that story? I'm also very much of a germaphobe, by the way. <laughs> believe me. Donald Trump wasn't bugged. No. Wasn't followed. No. Wasn't watched. No. And, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, he never had any, any, any business here. The report also makes the unsubstantiated claim there was secret communication last year between Moscow and the Trump campaign, allegedly directed by Vladimir Putin himself. It was alleged Mr Trump's lawyer, Michael Cohen, had met Kremlin officials in Prague, but Mr Cohen says he's never been there. I said, Mr Trump, I have never been to Prague. He said to me, OK. I said, do you would want to see my passport? I live close to the office. Right. And he said, yeah, you mind if I see it? And I said, of course not. <laughs> Mr. Trump yesterday accepted claims that Moscow did hack Democratic Party computers. And today his pick for CIA chief suggested in his confirmation hearing that a Trump administration would stand up to the Kremlin. Russia has reasserted itself aggressively, invading and occupying Ukraine, threatening Europe, and doing nothing to, to aid in the destruction and defeat of ISIS. But if any of the dossier produced by Orbis Intelligence is true, then the Russians have information on Trump they could use against him. Though not a single news organization, let alone US intelligence official, has verified any of its contents. Well, Jonathan Rugman joins us now. Uh, what more can you tell us about Christopher Steele? He was president of the Cambridge University Debating Society, the union, when he was a student. He went on into MI6. I've spoken to two former colleagues of his there. One described him as a very bright Russophile who had left MI6 unusually early to pursue a commercial career. Another described him as inept and not emotionally intelligent. But what both of them said was that Mr Steele must have believed what he had written was true. I think there are problems with his report. There are no caveats in it, which brings back memories of the intelligence failures leading up to the Iraq war. He apparently worked through intermediaries. He wasn't able to go to Moscow himself to meet these people. He used uh, Russian intermediaries instead. And the trouble for, for Mr Steele is that his company took on a job which he really shouldn't have taken on because Washington being Washington, this report was bound to come out at some point, and his cover as a former MI6 agent and the work of his company has been blown. Well, briefly, I mean, trouble. Is there any trouble for MI6 in all this? I think there is potentially trouble because the reputation of MI6 rises and falls in Washington with the reputation of the CIA itself. And if President Trump, as he will be, doesn't trust the CIA, then why should he trust uh, MI6? And I think it feeds into this narrative of people in the intelligence services being out to get Donald Trump, which, of course, uh, erodes trust uh, a great deal.
Jonathan Rugman. Well, now, earlier I spoke to the former Deputy Director of National Clandestine Service at the CIA, John Sarno. I began by asking him whether the intelligence community will determine now how the leak got out. Well, I think it'll be a, an issue for the, the new president, once he's in office, to make that, whether or not he decides to make that a priority for the intelligence community. Quite frankly, given the, the somewhat speculative nature of the allegations and the fact that the president-elect has already dismissed it as either fake news or uh, uncorroborated uh, information, uh, I seriously doubt it's going to be a major priority for the intelligence community after he assumes office. Well, I mean, you, you've had... Uh... Plenty of years of experience, and you must have seen presidents come and go. Have you ever seen an event like last night? No, I have to say that that was uh, completely unprecedented. Uh, certainly made for great theater, but no, I've never seen anything in my years of experience. Are Not you like worried that. at the state of relations between the intelligence community and the incoming president? Well, it's always a, a, a situation that's constantly in flux, and it's intelligence supports policy. So it's a question of the new president, every president, when they come in, they determine both the, the frequency, the duration, and the issues that the intelligence community will address for them. I think when he says that he respects the intelligence community, that he's being sincere, and that as the process works through in the early stages of his, of his presidency, that the relationship will build into one of mutual trust and respect. He has been talking, uh, both in the campaign and indeed in, in the, these recent days, of a kind of approach to Russia that the intelligence community must be completely unused to? Well, I think his, his issues with, with Russia, I mean, he, he looks at it, understandably, from a businessman's perspective, an international businessman. So he has had dealings with the Russians. And what he has said in, in recent days in terms of agreeing with the intelligence community that the Russians did somehow become involved with you know, the hacking into the Democratic National Committee, but he also caveated that by saying it's not just the Russians. There are other countries that do it. And that's just a fact of life in the international environment. If you were close to him in his intelligence entourage, would you have his mm -hmm. Twitter account shut down and keep him quiet on that score? Uh, that's an extremely excellent suggestion. Uh, ah. I would certainly encourage that. But uh, tweeting policy statements in 140 characters or less I think is not probably the best way to propagate those policies. Thank you very much for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you. That's John Sarno, from former CIA man. But joining us now from Washington, D.C., is Courtney Weinbaum, a national security expert at the Rand Corporation, who spent 14 years in the intelligence community at the Department of Defense. Uh, Courtney Weinbaum, are you as sanguine as John Sarno seems to be about the state of relations between... Uh, the intelligence community and Donald Trump. They seem to be pretty dire to us this side of the Atlantic. They're challenging so far. Um, we have to remember Donald Trump is not yet president. Um, his inauguration is still a week away. And I think there are a lot of people who are in a wait and see mode. You know, let's see how things change when he's actually holding the office, when this is his intelligence community and these agencies work for him personally. Um, and I think people are, are hopeful. They want to be optimistic and see, you know, what's going to happen once he finally takes office. Uh, but what, what do you make of this whole uh, business? I mean, do you think it's damaging, for example, for... Uh, U.S. intelligence and British intelligence, given that they work extremely closely together. If something comes between us, it ain't too good. I, I do think that it's damaging for a couple of reasons. First, any time a president publicly says that he lacks trust in his own agencies, any agency, let alone an intelligence agency, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt the people at that agency. It's going to make them think twice about their work in the future, about whether their work is valued, um, about how they should approach assessments in the future. That's one, one reason why it worries me. Another reason is we look at how this might impact international relations. Um, certainly information sharing between Great Britain and the U.S. Um, is one area where we could be concerned in the future. But there are hundreds of other countries out there, and the U.S. has healthy information sharing relationships with many of them. And if any country or any intelligence officials at, in other countries have pause, um, they worry now, maybe, that they shouldn't or they should think twice about sharing intelligence with the U.S. That could hurt the ability of the U.S. intelligence agencies to collect information in the future. As a former intelligence officer yourself, do you think the intelligence community sleeps easy, thinking um, that Donald Trump will have a good enough team around him 
to ensure somehow that he comes to behave as other presidents have when it comes to intelligence? Yeah. I really think that's an area where we're in wait and see mode. Um, today we saw the, um, the appointed director, the new director he appointed for CIA had his confirmation hearing today. Um, General Mattis, who's going to be appointed to Secretary of Defense, had his hearing today. Um, we know the Secretary of State um, had his hearing, I believe, yesterday. So in these hearings, what's coming out in some of these questions and answers is precisely this topic. How do these officials feel like their relationships will be with intelligence, with information, with foreign governments? Um, the, the future potential director of CIA said today that he has enormous faith in the intelligence officers and in the quality of their assessments. Um, he thinks that their work is, is a very high quality and very rigorous. And so he's already publicly stating that he puts his trust in these employees. So I think that these employees want to see who their leaders are going to be and how their leaders value their work. Courtney Weinbaum, thank you very much indeed for joining us from Washington. Thank you. Kathy. Thanks, John. Well, it might have been totally overshadowed by the leaked dossier scandal, but Donald Trump has also declared that he's passing control of his vast business empire to his sons. That hasn't impressed his critics much, who say failing to divest all corporate assets and divert profits to a blind trust will break with 40 years of precedent. Our Washington correspondent Kylie Morris now reports. These papers are just a piece of the many, many companies that are being put into trust. There it was, laid out for all to like see, the heaving the desk of paperwork years, meant to symbolize say, Donald Trump signing know. over control of his real estate bad, empire so to his sons. But few who understand the detail of how a businessman president might avoid a conflict of interest were convinced. No blind trust, no divestment of ownership, instead a plan merely to step aside. Senator Elizabeth Warren says it's not good enough. He, the president-elect, knows what will benefit him and his family financially. But the public doesn't. The only way that the American people can know that the president is working in their best interests and not in his own is if he divests and puts his assets in a true blind trust. There were additional absurd details in the plan Mr. Trump unveiled yesterday. A promise the business would not profit from any foreign government delegations staying at Trump hotels, like the one around the corner from the White House. Instead, with their room service orders and dry cleaning bills, they would contribute directly to American government coffers. As Mr. Trump goes through the motions of disentangling himself from his brand, he's building his political empire at speed. Inside another jewel of D.C. real estate, the U.S. Capitol building, Senate committees convened to consider the next chief of the Pentagon, the next housing secretary, and the next CIA chief, Mike Pompeo. In keeping with this turbulent week, there were strange goings on. Just as the Intelligence Committee began to demand answers from their nominee over Russian interference in the presidential election, this happened. That Russia, at the direction... Well, if you're looking for a metaphor for dark forces infiltrating American democracy, this is the Senate Intelligence Committee, and someone has literally turned out the lights. Now, of course, it wasn't the Russians. But this is a time of rapid change, and there is an unease that accompanies that. When the lights came back on, well, the Russians might have liked what they heard, that all their work is paying off. Is Vladimir Putin and the Russians looking at all this and saying, we've done a really good job of creating chaos, division, instability in the American political process? That's I, I have no doubt uh, that the discourse that's been taking place uh, is something that Vladimir Putin would look at and say, wow, that was among the objectives that I had. But it was in the dark of night that the most seismic and real political change occurred. Just as Donald Trump had promised, Republican senators began work on taking apart the nation's health care system limb by limb. Up to 30 million Americans will lose their health care, with many thousands dying as a result. Because you have no health insurance, and you can't go to a doctor or a hospital, you die. Democrats fought back, but they no longer have the power to prevent the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, the crowning glory of the Obama presidency.
Now, you may have the impression that there are many fast-moving developments in uh, in Washington this week. You're not wrong. A new one is that now uh, the Inspector General of the Department of Justice has just announced that he will launch an inquiry into the FBI and its handling of its inquiry into uh, Hillary Clinton's email practices. Uh, this is certainly a disturbing development, I think, for the intelligence community here, which is certainly feeling rather off balance given uh, some of the things that Donald Trump's uh, been saying saying and the very public uh, back and forth between himself and uh, the CIA director. Uh, most notably, it seems the probe will look specifically at the actions of director James Comey uh, and his last minute revisiting of the emails issue uh, and certainly, you know, hid the allegations very late in the day that were made against her, allegations that Democrats believe may have well played a, a strong uh, uh, at least contributed to her losing the election. So uh, a destabilizing time, certainly, for the intelligence community. Kylie Morris in Washington.